All right, we are live, we're on YouTube. Good morning, everybody. Before we start, I just want to give a big happy birthday wish oh. to our fabulous clerk, Marianne McMaster. Oh, oh happy, happy birthday. birthday. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> and don't worry, Marianne, we're, we're going to spare you the pain of listening to us sing. Okay. <laughs> Well, you thank you all to, very much. That you, needed to make her, you needed to make her turn on her video before you did that so we could talk <laughs> and be embarrassed. I did, shut it off. <laughs> I can see the red face oozing from even the, just the square. <laughs> With the mask. That's right. So um, we are here uh, at Appropriations again this morning to hear from um, our colleagues on various bond proposals. Um, so before we get started, um, I would like to start with introductions of the committee. So um, welcome back, uh, Representative Cardone. Would you like to start us off? Thank you. I'm Barbara Cardone. I represent House District 127, part of Bangor. And uh, Representative Corey. I'm Patrick Corey. I represent House District 25, which is part of Wyndham. Representative Cloutier. Good morning, I'm Kristen Cloutier. I represent House District 60, which is part of Lewiston. Um, and I have to head over and give testimony on a bill. Uh, so I'm gonna leave and come back. Great. Uh, Representative Arada. Good morning, my name is Amy Arada and I represent House District 65, which includes New Gloucester and part of Poland. Uh, Representative Hymanson. Good morning, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Patty Hymanson, I represent House District 4, which is parts of York, Wells, Sanford, and all of Algonquin. Um, Representative Millett. Morning. Um, I'm Soen Millett, House District 71, towns of Norway, Sweden, Waterford, and West Paris. Uh, Representative Martin. He's on the phone. Representative Martin, would you like to introduce yourself? Apparently not, um, <laughs> maybe later. How about Senator Bailey? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Donna Bailey. I represent Senate District 31, which is Saco, Old Orchard Beach, Hollis, Lemington, and part of Buxton. Senator Davis. Good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you. My name is Paul Davis. I represent Senate District 4, which is all of Piscataquis, Patrick, Somerset, and Penobscot. Um, Senator Davis had some big news in his district about some uh, finance authority of Maine investment coming to your local big Moose Mountain. It's a ski area up there. They're going to rebuild the everything. The base That's line, exciting. The, the uh, lift. There's also uh, going to be a uh, front down on Moosehead. It, it, it's, it's really going to be something. They're going to, if the whole thing goes through, there's going to be a bunch of people go to work up there. It, it's great. It's great. Very I remember exciting. back uh, years ago, there was well over 100 people that worked there in the wintertime. Big deal in that small area. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Martin, are you ready to introduce yourself? Hi, John Martin. I'm still sideways, but we're trying to fix it. <laughs> great. You're still from uh, Eagle Lake, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, my good co-chair, Representative Purse. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I am Teresa Purse. I represent House District 44, which is the majority of Falmouth, and I serve as the House Chair of Appropriations and Financial Affairs. And I'm looking forward to come visiting uh, Senator Davis at the new ski resort. So uh, that'll be fun. Yeah. And I am State Senator Kathy Breen. I represent six and a half communities in Cumberland County in the State Senate, and I serve as Senate Chair of Appropriations. Um, I just want to let folks know that from the public, that you know this committee is holding its public hearing uh, but lots of other committees are doing work today so various members of this committee will be popping off and on throughout our session as um, we have obligations in for our own bills in other committees so um, rest assured that all of our all the testimony we hear today will be on the record and will be have that available to us um, I will also say for folks who are here to testify um, that if you're here for multiple bills, 
you are certainly welcome to say that and just speak once. Um, but I would also suggest that you make sure you submit your written testimony electronically for each of the LDs that you're addressing um, so that your uh, testimony becomes part of the permanent record for each LD. Um, make sure you do that and not, even though you might speak only once, make sure you are careful about submitting it for every bill. So um, are there any questions from the committee or anything before we get started? Representative Fay, did I forget to introduce you? Um, no, I don't think you forgot. Okay. <laughs> I neglected to. Uh, I just wanted to say, Representative Fay, I'm here. Uh, and um, I represent House District 66, which is parts of the towns of Casco, Poland, and Raymond. And I was semi here yesterday. I had a little minor reaction to my second vaccination. So, um, so it's ha I'm happy to be back. Well, thank you for raising your hand and um, making sure you introduce yourself and my apologies. Um, any other questions before we get started? All right, so our first bill um, is LD21. And uh, we have the Senate president here, Senator Jackson, uh, here to present the bill. I'll promote him now um, from attendee to panelist. Good morning, Ooh. Mr. President. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, Senator Breen, Representative Purse, members of the Joint Standing Committee on Appropriations and Financial Affairs. My name is Troy Jackson. I have the great honor of serving as President of the Maine Senate, and I proudly represent District 1, which is northern Rusty County, stretching roughly from Caribou North to the St. John Valley. Uh, the district that I represent has a lot uh, to offer people in our state. Uh, we have a beautiful natural landscape, kind and hardworking people and a rich history that includes a significant Franco-American culture in addition to Scotch, Irish, Swedish. Uh, we have uh, quite, a, quite a collection of people uh, across uh, Rusty County with the influence and I'm obviously very proud to represent there. It's also home to one of the top educational institutions in the country, the main school of science and mathematics uh, which is located in Limestone, which is on the very southern end of my district. Those familiar with the school are already aware of the important contributions this institution has made to the students both inside and outside of Maine. Founded in 1995 by the Maine Legislature, MSSM is a public residential magnet school that serves high school students from across the state and around the world. In 2019, U.S. News and World Report named MSSM the number one high school in Maine, the number two high school in the United States, and the number two magnet school in the U.S. Later that year, Newsweek further recognized MSSM by placing it in the top 10 STEM high schools in the country. And Boston's ABC affiliate released, released a video highlighting the school's excellence. As a son of a public school teacher, I understand the importance of education and the impact it can have on a young person's life. To the people of Maine, the value of this school is undeniable. Despite this fact, it has been too long since a significant investment has been made to improve the residential facilities or make building upgrades. Furthermore, these outdated facilities are widely recognized is one of the challenges facing the school's future. After talking with people in the area and consulting with people closely involved in the school, I decided to put this bond proposal before the committee in early 2020, before the COVID-19 pandemic hit and the legislature adjourned. Since then, the challenges of the pandemic has caused some further strains in the school, including the challenge of providing a safe learning environment that recognizes the emotional and intellectual well-being of the gifted students at the school. I'm before you again, the hopes that you can do your part to ensure that MSSM remains a shining gem in Rusty County. This proposal will give 10 million to the MSSM for a new dorm facility. 
The money would also be used to renovate and expand existing dorms at the school in Limestone. This would help to address both the problem of outdated facilities at the school and the problem of limited space to housing the, the attending students at MSSM. Given the combination of these factors, I believe the time is now to invest in the school that has made us so proud. And I would further say that, you know, I was not at all a part of the force that brought uh, this school to Limestone. I don't know, uh, you know, what was the driving factor, uh, but I do think uh, that the state uh, through the years has probably not um, done as much as it could have to invest in the school. And, and despite that, um, the school has done extremely well. And like I said, it's really one of the shining uh, lights that we have in Orsett County. As I said, Limestone is on the lower southern end of my district, but uh, I had the good fortune of <clears throat> having a grandfather that ran a farm there and my mother and her family uh, attended Limestone High School in the days of uh, Loring Air Force Base. And in subsequent years, when I was a young boy, I remember going back there and uh, you know, attending functions with my family. In Limestone, uh, for someone that came from either the town of Allegash or the town of St. Francis, I lived in both of them uh, periodically throughout my uh, younger years. A place like Limestone was a big deal. Uh, you know, it's a big, big place for me. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, that has changed, obviously, with uh, the removal of Limestone Air Force Base, Loring Air Force Base. And the area is not uh, what I remember it as a child which is unfortunate, but the, the school is a big deal. It's a huge deal for the area. And, and you hear uh, people that attended the school that are not from Aroostook County talk about how, uh, you know, the education they received there uh, was excellent, but being in limestone was a big part of uh, what helped them, uh, you know, do as well as they did with their educational process. Uh, I've heard that consistently from people that have uh, attended the school. And, you know, there's no doubt that I'm sure some of you may have heard, uh, had some conversations with people uh, about um, Magnus School and Limestone and, and moving it, uh, which I think is really unfortunate. Uh, you know, it's done so well, despite the state's inattention to it. Uh, I believe, and people that have attended there believe, because of uh, as much a part of where it's at and, and uh, you know, the atmosphere in the community uh, being, being part of um, the rich process that's there. And so, you know, I would, obviously, it's, I'm biased. I represent that area. But... You know, if you look at the results of what has happened there, I think it's undeniable that it, it does very, very well. And, and it's probably time that the state did more to make sure that it continues to be uh, the shining example, the, the gold standard um, across the state and across this country. That's why I feel very strongly about this bond. Uh, if you if you go to the facility, I mean, they've done well, but they, they need upgrades. Uh, they need upgrades to uh, have more people attend. They're at their maximum capacity. Uh, and this would allow more uh, students to come if they wanted to. And, and that's why I feel it's a very strong um, proposal to, to finally uh, put some investment in the school. You know, and I'd just further uh, end with, you know, there's a lot of talk at times about two mains, uh, things like that. Some of it real, um, a lot of it uh, not at all, a lot of it, you know, imagined. Uh, but I think uh, some of the turmoil that's happened right now uh, certainly lends some credit to people's uh, belief that there is uh, two mains. You know, I've certainly tried to push back against that. You know, I have people 
uh, throughout Southern Maine that have helped me more than, than anything uh, to try and do things for my district. And so I, I know we're one Maine, uh, but this idea that uh, the Bagot School uh, should leave uh, Rusta County so it could reach its full potential when everything uh, already shows that it's doing so great, uh, despite uh, the state not actually doing as much as it probably should have throughout the years. So that's why I'm very passionate, probably more so than even last year when I presented this bill. Um, I think I think it's time. I think it's time that uh, the state uh, makes more due on its commitment. Uh, I think the school's already shown, like I said, uh, that it's doing extremely well uh, in spite of um, not having the uh, resources that uh, it, it probably should have. Anywhere else, any other state would be putting a lot more into an institution that has shown itself to be so great as uh, the Magnet School. So that's why I put the bill in. That's why I'm hopeful that the committee can see its way to supporting it. And I'll certainly try and answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. President. Are there any questions from the committee for Senator Jackson? Uh, not seeing any. So I'm going to ask uh, folks in the attendee list if there's anybody here um, in the in attendance um, who, uh, oh, I see Representative McCray is here with his hand up. So um, Representative McCray, I will move you over to a panelist. There he is. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for, for that uh, lift. I hope it wasn't too much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good morning, folks. Uh, I, uh, I appreciate this opportunity. Senator Breen, Representative Peirce, and uh, the other members of AFA. Uh, I am Representative David McRae, and I do represent good people of District 148, which does include and encompass main MSSM. Uh, I am in strong support of this bill, as that should come as no surprise to you. Uh, I am a former teacher. I uh, spent my entire 48-year career in the neighboring town of Fort Fairfield. Uh, I was very much aware of how this, this uh, school got its start. Uh, it actually, the impetus came when Loring Air Force Base pulled out leaving Limestone High School with pro for, going from a school of perhaps between four and 500 students to a school of perhaps 100. Limestone is not a big town, but Loring Air Force Base made it a big town and, and made it so that it had a lot of students. Well, there they were. Well, I had a lot of friends and colleagues uh, in the school system, in, in management, in administration, and a lot of uh, people in Limestone uh, kind of feeling at the time that the sky is falling. What can we do? What can we do? What can we do to support our school, to keep the school here, to keep it viable? And uh, some core of educators came across the idea of let's explore how to set up a, a world-class uh, school, uh, a STEM school. STEM, I don't think was even really invented 26 years ago. I think that's a relatively new term, but it was a STEM school. And I know several people uh, that were on that foundational group and they traveled all over the country. I was kind of envious of the trips that they got to take because it was kind of uh, on the federal dime to explore those possibilities because of the closure of Loring. Uh, and they went on junkets all over the place and came back with this fantastic uh, uh, model for a school, uh, worked tirelessly to put it in, in case, so in, in place. So I guess that's the history. And I was, I was around, I sent kids there. They always came back, Mr. McRae, this is the greatest place. Uh, and, it's, and it's a very special kind of kid that wants to go to a place like that. And it's sort of a birds of a feather flock together kind of, kind of place. Uh, so anyway, uh, that's the history. Uh, it has been declared the number two high school uh, in the country. And over the last 10 years or so, it has been in the top 100 schools. So I'm going to ask that you, as members, 
consider how many schools that might be that it is chosen number two out of. And I would ask, I would, I would appreciate it if somebody would ask me at the end of this, how many high schools are there in the country? Because I did the research, I had, I didn't know. Okay. Uh, so anyway, uh, it is, it's, it's a magnificent school. The entire state is proud of it. You can't go anywhere in the state and talk to educators or parents that won't say, oh my God, I can't believe that this great school is in our state, let alone in Aroostook County. Uh, so uh, I, I have always felt uh, since it began that it became such a great success, not in spite of the fact that it was up in Limestone, Maine, but rather because it's in Limestone, Maine. The distractions there are not the same as they would be in a more uh, urban center, for sure. And I've talked with numerous students that would that would uh, support that that feeling. Uh, I have to say that the state has not provided the financial support that would have kept the facility uh, in great shape. I think it's high time that ha that happens. Uh, especially over the last few years, they've been flat funded. I think I heard somewhere uh, from people that were in the know that it's been kind of flat funded uh, for the last six years. Well, hardly any institution of any type uh, can go six years flat funded and not uh, see the difference, the problems. I do see this, this, this bond proposal as the first and foundational step for the state to make in, in moving this school into the facility that this great school deserves to be in. They're gonna be, they are great in spite of the fact that that hasn't happened. Think about that, okay? Uh, they are that great a school and the facility, uh, if you were to visit it, you'd say, really? How do they become such a great school with the spot that they're in? And it's time that they're in a better spot in limestone but it's it's the facility it isn't the location okay so I, I think this dormitory proposal is is timely it is long overdue for that matter uh and i would like to see uh uh this committee support the bond proposal uh and then we'll go to making sure that it passes so i would appreciate you asking any questions you care to ask of me thank you very Thanks, much for the time Secretary. Looks like uh, Representative Arada has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question is either, either for Representative McCray or Senator Jackson. Um, I was on the construction committee for the State Board of Education. And so I'm a, it's been a few years. I'm a little familiar with that process. Is this school involved in um, being ranked and then uh, applying for funding for construction within the same process that all the other public schools in the state are, are a part of? Do you know? I'll jump in, but maybe Senator Jackson would have a better feel for that. Uh, I'm quite intimately involved with the situation as it currently stands. And I have not heard anything about uh, the ability to get on the school reconstruction list or construction list. I'm also on the education committee. Uh, and I think uh, with some of the discussions that have happened, I probably would have heard of that, but representative, I appreciate the question. It makes me kind of wonder, I will check that, but uh, I, my guess is that it's not. For whatever yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's a guess, so I won't hold you to it. <laughs> okay, thank you. We can probably find that out um, through our office. Good. You know, ask, um, uh, Rachel Tremblay in OFPR to figure that out for us. Uh, it looks like Senator Jackson is back on. Do you, did you wanna address that question, Senator Jackson? Well, I, I think Senator Breen, that you, your uh, recommendation would probably be best. Uh, I think because uh, the school shares its space with Limestone High School, I don't think they have that ability because they don't actually own uh, the, the space. Uh, Limestone High School would have to go through that. So it's, it's I think, probably not allowed uh, for the magnet school. But the dorm is uh, theirs. And obviously, the 
children are there obviously for the, you know weeks on end and need a need a facility to stay at and that's why it's important in this case to have something more appropriate for them but but i don't think it's allowed and you certainly can check that out because there's a pretty robust process through which the schools apply and then are evaluated and then the funding is given to the the schools and the most need and then of course the community has to has to vote to approve it and contribute a, a share um, but yeah, I'd be interested in, in knowing how much, how this, this school participates in the process, if at all. Thank you. Um, I oh, think we might be hearing from some other um, people who are testifying who might be able to answer that question too. Okay, good, um, thank Representative you. Representative McCray, is there something else you wanted to say? Yes, I just want to remind the committee that this is, this has to do with, I mean, MSSM is a residential, residential school. Uh, kids stay there, they need a dormitory. This isn't, you know, that school revolving funding, revolving fund probably wouldn't address uh, dormitories in the first place. And just because I don't think anybody else has asked, uh, the number of high schools in the United States is 27,000 and MSSM is number two on that list. So I was quite impressed when I saw that number. Had to tell you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we have a few other folks uh, in line to testify. Um, so if you are here uh, and you'd like to speak on this bill, uh, please raise your hand in the attendee panel. Um, and Representative McCray, I'm gonna send you back over to attendee land. Thank you for joining us. And I see Grayson Orn. So I'm going to move um, Grayson Orn over to the panel. Hi, uh, yeah, good morning. Um, I guess Senator Breen, I represent Pierce and the uh, honorable members of this Joint Standing Committee on Appropriations and Financial Affairs. Uh, my name is Grayson Orr and I'm a student member of the State Board of Education. And I'm here today to speak on behalf of the State Board to, in support of uh, LD21. Uh, the State Board strongly endorses this bill and encourages uh, broad-based ought to pass vote in support of uh, Maine's Magnet School for Math and Science. While I'm a member of the board, I'm also a student at the Maine School of Science and Math. Uh, I am a junior. I've been there for three years. Um, and uh, in these years, I've had the privilege of working with some of the best students in the state and uh, some of the greatest educators that we have. Um, I am uh, friends with students leading research projects at universities across the country. Uh, I know students who attend the schools in the Ivy League. Uh, some of the greatest schools in the University of California system, uh, Northwestern, really any of these uh, top universities in the state. I'm even uh, friends with one of the youngest presidential electors in history, uh, Jay Philbrick, who graduated in the class of 2020. Uh, for a school of only 125 nestled within walking distance to the Canadian border, I believe this is frankly pretty incredible. Uh, however, as a student body, we often feel uh, quite overlooked by uh, the state and sometimes other manners. Uh, we, we were ranked second in the nation just uh, two short years ago, yet we're uh, forced to operate in just one academic building in a, in a school that, uh, well, one academic wing in a school shared by a local elementary school. Uh, our dormitory, I believe, uh, I could be wrong, but I believe it used to be the uh, Limestone Middle School prior to the closing of Loring, and uh, it's decided in in some aspects deteriorating while we're there. Uh, there have been multiple occasions in my time at MSSM where pipes have burst, uh, flooding the rooms of students with uh, uh, scalding water, uh, bathrooms become flooded, uh, the mail rooms become flooded once. Uh, on occasion, electrical outlets in our lower lounge where we do often do homework have just fallen out of the wall. Uh, last year, we had a gas leak uh, randomly and I had to evacuate the dorm for a few hours. The first sentence of our mission statement states that the Maine School of Science and Mathematics brings together and helps a group of Maine's most academically and motivated high school students become innovative, well-rounded scholars with the ability to develop, investigate, and communicate critical ideas that improve the human condition and benefit the state of Maine. By chaining ourselves to deteriorating aging buildings, we are actively disregarding the mission of our school as we are discouraging applications of new students who may benefit 
benefit from an education here and as such benefit the state of Maine in the future. Um, the state of our facilities is quite often uh, a reason that students choose not to apply, at least some students that I have uh, from my area that I have talked to. And this, I am not the, I don't believe I'm the best to speak on affairs with faculty, but in my discussions with some of them, we have had certain faculty applicants who just choose not to apply to the school due to its um, facilities. This school is a, it's a haven for Maine's best and brightest, and um, we are doing them a disservice and we are doing the state a disservice if we, uh, if our facilities cannot keep in line with uh, the magnitude of the students we have here. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions the committee may have and I'll hopefully be available for work sessions on the bill if necessary. Thank you very much. Any questions from the committee for Grayson? Not seeing any. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. And just make sure you submit your testimony, you know, through the online portal. Great. I'm going to send you back to attendee land um, and see if there's anyone else who wants to testify on this who is in attendance. I don't see any other hands up. So I will just wow. ask a uh, last call for folks. Oh, it looks like. Um, Alan Whittemore is here and wants to speak. So I will admit you into the panel now. Good morning, you wanna turn on your camera so we can see your face? Oh, sorry. That's okay. Oh, there it is. You'd think I'd be used to Zoom by now. Um, Welcome. Thank you, thank you uh, Senator Breen, uh, Representative uh, Pearson, uh, members of the committee. I appreciate the, the opportunity to speak. And um, uh, I uh, am a Mainer, uh, otherwise known as a maniac. I grew up in the great uh, town of Rumford um, and was at the University of Maine admissions office when an ad in the paper back in 1994 uh, was soliciting an admissions director at the Maine School of Science and Math. I applied and that was the beginning of my um, journey into boarding school admissions. Uh, uh, under the tutelage of uh, Jim Patterson, what we refer to as the founder of this school. Uh, as the first employee uh, uh, tasked with attracting the first class of MSS students to Limestone, I began referring to the, to the perspectives as pioneers. It was a fitting moniker then and remains so today. Uh, why? Be considering the unique geography of Maine, the vast majority of Mainers uh, have never ventured to Aroostook County. I mean, never. If I could re rely on the use of a meme, most Mainers, even the native, have an image of Bangor as being Northern Maine. Anything farther north is either the uncivilized territory used for logging, I'll do respect to Senator Jackson, um, and uh, there's a big mountain stuck out there somewhere, uh, and then a small sliver of land reserved for the potato farmer. Uh, oh, by the way, there's lots of snow year round, just as it's doing so out my window. Um, but for the 15 year old who chooses to give up all that is familiar in their lives, their parents, the dog, the neighborhood, their best friend down the street, their neighbors, to leave everything that is comfortable and known and known to them solely for the primary purpose to be challenged requires a certain chutzpah. It is the special sauce that I often hear that why is it so successful up here in Limestone and as, Senator, as Representative McRae said, it's uh, because of the location, not in spite of it. Uh, for many of the students, it was the first time ever to come to Limestone, uh, either for the open house or uh, for summer camp. Um, nearly half of the current students, uh, student body attended at least one week of MSSM uh, STEM summer camp. Uh, to most, a summer camp is based primarily, uh, a summer camp based primarily on education uh, would not fit. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want to. I don't normally testify um, a definition of summer camp. 
but not true for over 500 students each summer for the past 25 years, including virtually so during the, the, uh, the last summer uh, during the pandemic. And Limestone, whether it's a middle schooler at our camp or later on as a newly enrolled high school student, MSSM marked the beginning of a modern day adventure for over a thousand graduates so far during the past 27 years. They are risk takers who deliberately seek a path most find less than appealing. The result, a bonding greater than even the most traditional boarding school, a consistently nationally ranked in the top 100 second secondary schools. Um, you've heard that we're second in the nation. They rely on one another as they live under one roof, although that one roof has had its issues as uh, our student uh, representative just uh, testified. Um, uh, and most of our faculty do have housing uh, here on Trafton Avenue. There are 13 houses now, um, and uh, they are surviving uh, under some of the most brutal winters that Maine has to offer. We don't have snow days up here. Um, we all live on campus for the most part, um, and, and this cannot be replicated anywhere else. It would not work. The location is the special sauce. Uh, the school is residential only, even for residents of Limestone. Um, this ensures that it is the main school of science and mathematics where everyone is treated the same in the admission process. Uh, consistently, all 16 counties are represented, represented from Kittery to Freiburg to Lubeck to Fort Kent. To be located in a small town helps those scholars from equally small towns to consider attending and not be intimidated by a large me metropolitan lines, landscape or, or campus. Um, and without its uh, myriad of distractions. The students here consider one another not by the style of their clothes or bank account, but by what they can bring to the classroom discussion or to the study group uh, or to each other. It is a unique environment that simply can't be replicated. Um, we opened uh, with 135 students in the fall of 1995. Uh, in the same dormitory that was a school building rep, uh, reconfigured into a dormitory. Uh, we are consistently at 130 students. Um, I mean, now uh, we, because of COVID um, and because of quality of life, we've had to use uh, quads and, and triples. Um, our residential staff uh, have no separate entrances to the, to, the, to the school. And they've been with us, uh, many of them, a majority of them have been with us for going on uh, eight, nine years. Um, so their quality of life would also be affected as well as the students. Uh, so I really, uh, again, appreciate um, the, uh, the time you've given me and, and consideration for uh, Senator Jackson's um, uh, bill. And, and, uh, and it's great to see Representative Martin, who was who was part of uh, opening uh, the, the school uh, some 27 years ago. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Whittemore. Are there any questions from the committee for Mr. Whittemore? Senator Breedens, John, I'd like to make a couple of comments when you get a chance. Sure thing. Thank you. Any um, questions for Mr. Whittemore? Uh, Representative Millett. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was curious, Mr. Whittemore, if you could comment on how the unique situation that you're in um, have coped with the COVID virus in terms of in-person learning and vaccination rates and masking and so on during the uh, previous academic year that ended just early in the pandemic and the year that we're now in. Have you been able to continue to have in-person instruction uh, throughout or have, have you had to modify it? Uh, thank you for asking. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a testament to, to our, our students um, of, of being willing to uh, adhere to the guidelines of the, the state and national CDC. We uh, have been uh, running uh, in a cohort situation, uh, roughly splitting the population, the dormitory population in, in halves uh, at six week uh, intervals. We're excited uh, uh, that this last upcoming, we're now in the middle of April vacation, uh, this last uh, five week uh, stint, uh, we'll be bringing uh, everyone back on campus. Uh, we've had uh, testing we require before they uh, enter the dormitory to provide a, much like the University of Maine system, uh, to provide uh, a negative uh, COVID test result. Um, 
we, we took the students that are 16 years uh, of age and older over to NMCC um, that has this uh, clinic uh, for the vaccination. Um, we, uh, are, uh, we, we, we adhere to all the, the, the masking, including uh, uh, outdoors, even when, when they were playing intramural uh, sports or whatnot, uh, obviously in, in the buildings. Uh, and they are divided up into cohorts where uh, they have to exercise social distancing. Our meals are, uh, the, the dining hall is, is spaced out. So we've been successful. We did have uh, only two cases that uh, in the middle of uh, that, the big one, the, the January surge after the holidays. Uh, and that was, um, that was it. It didn't spread any further. We didn't have any outbreak. Uh, so, um, and that was because quite frankly, these students, in my opinion, care so much about this experience that they were, uh, if they were willing to give up, as I mentioned earlier, everything uh, back home uh, to come here, they were willing to um, adhere to to uh, um, to the the, the necess necessity to keep the, the the pandemic under control. Thank you for asking. Thank you for your response. Any other questions for Mr. Whittemore? All right. Thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, Representative Martin, why don't you uh, turn on your uh, your video if you can and, and make your comments. Yeah, the host had blocked me off of the video, so, but I, I can do the, the... Oh, now you're on mute. So I'm fine now. Okay, let me just be very brief. Uh, at this point, probably you'll hear more from me in Appropriations Committee, but I, as Mr. Whittemore pointed out, I was involved uh, in when the school was created. Uh, the sponsor of the legislation was a former uh, Sue Pines, who passed away last year, uh, and she uh, was a driving force. And it was a result of the closure of the base, uh, with all of a sudden we have all these buildings. And of course, some of which we still own as a state, and uh, we haven't quite figured out what to do with some of those. But what Fort Fairfield, of course, they had this beautiful high school that the federal government built. And, and then they had this available space that could be used for housing. And that's how it evolved into what became MSSM. Uh, one of the five, it's all been pointed out, it's one of the best in the country. And, and it is, I think, in part because of its location, it's away from any things that can happen near a city or whatever. And, and, and it is a best location. And for those students who've gone there, they will tell you basically how successful they've been as a result of that. Of that. And, and I, think, I think I do want to point out to Reza Rara uh, that uh, this request is not for a building because uh, the building is fine, the school building is fine. Uh, and so this basically would be uh, for dormitory space, and which of course is not covered by the, the legislation uh, that the Department of Education has. And so we can talk more about that as we get to uh, work session. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Martin. Any questions from the committee for Representative Martin? All right, well, we know where to find you if we do. Um, so is there anyone else uh, in the attendee list who would like to testify on LD21? If so, please put your hand up, your electronic hand up. I'm not seeing any. So um, I think I will close the public hearing for LD21 and thank you all for joining us today. Um, we are gonna move on to our second providing, presiding officer um, and that bond proposal. Um, today we have, uh, I don't know if Representative Fecto is here, Speaker Fecto, um, but he should be here shortly if not. And um, we will be hearing from him on his bond proposal, which is LD 298. And then we'll be hearing from our own uh, Representative Millet on LD 702. So um, we will give the speaker a minute or two to join us and um, hopefully we'll be here 
he will be here soon. I'm actually gonna take a quick break from my um, office and I will be right back. I see that um, the speaker has joined us, so we'll bring him over as a panelist. You, if you wanna go ahead, Representative Person start, I'll be right back. Thank Great, you. look forward to your return, thank you. Speaker Fecto, welcome. Hello. Hello. <laughs> uh, Senator Bean, Representative Purse, and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Appropriations and Financial Affairs. I am Ryan Fecto, and I represent part of my hometown of Biddeford. I also have the distinct honor of serving as Speaker of the House. Today, I am proud to present LD-298, an act to authorize a general fund bond issue to fund capital improvements in equipment for career and technical education centers and regions to prepare students to join Maine's workforce, a big mouthful of a, of a title for a bill. Uh, any homeowner in search of a plumber or driver in need of a mechanic understands the critical workforce shortages that exist in our state. Uh, constituents tell me about the challenges of finding an electrician or contractor to perform small tasks in their homes. I'm sure you've heard the same. During bouts of particularly cold weather, we've heard of oil delivery companies struggling to keep up not because they lack supply, but rather because they lack drivers. Our state sorely needs well-trained workers in many sectors. Our public education system has 28 CT schools with an expansive reach. You can find CT centers in nearly every corner of Maine, from Farmington to Callis and Biddeford to Frenchville. Students from those towns and cities, as well as surrounding communities, benefit from their offerings. Main CT centers are preparing our students for well-paid, in-demand jobs. Whether it be a student who aspires to be a welder, a nurse, a computer programmer, or an electrician, the CTE system offers main students the training they need to be successful. We have the infrastructure, we have de dedicated educators and driven students, but in order to meet the needs of our students and our economy, we need to ensure the equipment and infrastructure at these locations are foremost maintained, repaired, or replaced. That means investing in equipment and capital improvements. Last year, I connected with CT centers across the state to assess their capital needs. From Sanford to Prescott, it became clear that CT centers are in severe need of investment. For example, the Oxford Hills Technical Center in Norway is looking to add a much needed welding program which means investing roughly $500,000 in equipment and updating a space to suit the program's needs. Region two school in Holton needs updated equipment for its forestry program, including a processor, forwarder, and a skidder. We all know how important the forest product sector is to our rural economy, and this equipment, crucial to training students for today's industry, will run them more than a million, uh, almost $2 million. Extrapolate this need across the state and it is clear to me that we must take immediate action to invest in our CT schools. I am confident that this investment will yield high returns for our students and our economy and our workforce. Many of the careers that our CTE specialize in are high paying. Welders, HVAC installers, machinists, and licensed practical nurses all have medium incomes over 40,000. This investment in our CTE system is not merely an investment in equipment. It will serve as a catalyst for economic activity. This is also an investment that will help Maine meet our workforce demands. According to the Maine Department of Labor, by 2028, Maine will need nearly 200 welders, 287 electricians, 700 carpenters, and over 900 nurses. Maine has a workforce shortage and bolstering our state CTEs will simultaneously bolster our workforce development pipeline. Main CTE schools are invaluable resources, and with the investment proposed in LD-298, they can train a new generation prepared to meet the technological advancements in many careers throughout our state. Uh, thank you for the consideration. I am happy to answer any questions. Uh, one thing that was not included in my testimony that I would note is the last time we sent a bond to voters 
to uh, invest in our CT schools was 1998. Uh, I, I like to joke that at the time uh, I was six years old. Um, you know, I think it's well past time that we make uh, this crucial investment in these schools so that they can make an investment in our students and, and thus make an investment in our economy. So thanks for your time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We appreciate your testimony. Are there any questions for the speaker? See none. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. See you all later. Senator Breen, would you like to take back the role or do you want me to continue? Why don't you just continue I'll, with- I'll finish now. this one. How's that? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we have a couple people. Uh, if you're attending this meeting and you'd like to speak on this bill, I'd ask you to raise your hand in our attendee system. You go to the uh, lower part and then we'll call you over. I see Wilson Hess has asked to speak. And so you're coming over through the, through the ether. Did we lose him somewhere? No, oh, there we go. Anyway, there we are. Wilson Hess, are you with us? There we are. I, I, I think I'm with you now. I, uh, uh, Representative Purse, uh, thank you. I think you're sitting in the chair if I've been keeping track of things. And uh, so, so, uh, Senator Breen and distinguished members of the committee, I apologize. I'm, I'm working on two computers and trying to do a state board uh, committee meeting and, uh, and, and keep track of your important work. So uh, thank you. Um, and uh, uh, I realize I can't uh, speak in regards to LD21, but I was so, so grateful that we had uh, our student members speak and thank you for entertaining uh, that. Uh, my name is Wilson Hess. I'm chair of the State Board of Education here today to speak uh, on behalf of the board uh, in support of LD298, <clears throat> an act authorized general fund bond issue to fund capital improvements and equipment for career and technical education centers and regions to prepare students for Maine's uh, workforce. State Board of Education has a specific interest uh, in career and technical education um, we serve as the state agency for administering federal funds for co construction of schools and facilities and career and technical education. Um, and we also administer any federal funds received uh, for the benefit of career and technical education programs in the state. And specifically, uh, that refers to uh, federal so-called Perkins 5 funds. Um, in 2020, after a year-long review, uh, we received federal approval for a five-year uh, state plan uh, under Perkins 5 uh, for career and technical education uh, in the state. Um, today, I would like to share four observations uh, with the Joint Committee in regards to uh, LD298. One, as, as Speaker Fetko so ably demonstrated, there's great need. Uh, Maine's population has the highest median age in the country, as you're well aware. The working age population has already begun to shrink due to high numbers of retiring baby boomers, people who have hair this color of mine, um, and uh, low numbers of young people entering the job market. Today, there are unfilled jobs at middle-class pay scales all around the state, even in our most rural areas. Uh, the reason these jobs are unfilled is that many potential job applicants don't have the minimum skills necessary for entry skills, which our high school CTE programs can provide. Second point, we know the greatest areas of needs. The job sectors uh, that are in demand now and are projected to be in demand in Maine for the next 10 years include things like computer analysis, construction, engineering, healthcare, hospitality, manufacturing, transportation all areas which our CTE programs uh, can help um, provide qualified candidates for. Third point, the State Board is setting the roadmap for the future. Uh, as, as mentioned before in the, uh, the Perkins 5 plan, the State Board's uh, uh, strategic goals have, have, have been recognized to advance um, um, uh, CTE. 
to extend programs uh, into ninth and 10th grade, uh, to uh, bring uh, CT explorations in, into the middle school, uh, and to try to provide more funds for um, uh, direct instruction. Of the 6.5 roughly million dollars that Maine will receive next year uh, in Perkins funds, 85% goes directly to local CTEs and our seven community colleges, uh, much of which is the primary source of equipment for the recipients. Perkins monies are the major source of equipment funding for our 27 CTE schools. Uh, and I believe, again, Speaker Fedco did a very good job uh, explaining um, uh, some of that need. But our fourth point is indeed that keeping facilities and equipment in education aligned to current industry standards, which is critical for CTEs, is an enormous expense in which we fall further behind every year. To illustrate, I just very briefly uh, give you a couple of examples. Just one automotive facility would cost about $5 million. Um, and its equipment would cost nearly 500,000 more. Likewise, just one nursing healthcare facility costs about $200,000. And a single low-end patient stimulator also known in the trade as a sim man or sim woman or sim baby, uh, cost between fifty and seventy thousand um, dollars. With a total of twenty-three programs, which fall into ten career clusters, uh, offered across Maine's twenty-seven CTE centers and regions, the cost of meeting industry standards in secondary CTE is far beyond the current capacity of our EPS funding cycle, our local resources, and the Perkins allocations. Um, so we want to be able to keep pace uh, with trends in our existing programs. Um, we want our students to be well prepared to be part of a 21st century workforce. The need is great for a statewide CTE capacity that can truly address our present and future workforce needs. The State Board believes that LD298 provides an important step forward in that regard. We strongly import, support um, LD298, uh, encourage uh, and ought to pass. Be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, are there any questions for Mr. Hess? I do not see any. I appreciate you your time. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. I don't see anyone else with their hand raised uh, for in our attendee section to comment on this bill. I'll just give it a minute to see if anyone else would like to comment. Seeing none, then I will uh, close the public hearing on LD298. And I'll turn the gavel back over to my good co-chair. Thank you very much, Representative Purse. Um, so uh, our Next bill is um, LD702 um, brought to us today um, by our own representative Millet. Um, so I will uh, open the public hearing now for LD702 and Representative Millet, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's actually LD481, but um, I, I will- Pardon me. I think I think I am up uh, yeah, that was quick. 41, correct? I apologize. Um, I misspoke. We are going to do the public hearing for LD481. I had the wrong representative millet uh, on my paper. So LD481 is representative Sowan millet. And um, that is the public hearing that we are beginning right now. So ap I apologize for my mistake. And uh, Representative Millet, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Senator Breen, Representative Purse, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Education, on Appropriations and Financial Affairs. I am Soan Millett of Waterford. I represent House District 71. I'm pleased this morning to present LD 481, an act to propose a general fund bond issue to train workers in high demand sectors and to support the state's 10 year economic plan goal of increasing wages by 10%. 
That economic development plan and strategy lays out a focus on talent and innovation over the 2020, 29 decade. And it is designed to do three things, but two of them directly relate to the bill in front of you. One is to attract 75,000 people to Maine's talent pool and to grow the annual wages by 10% over that decade. That goal of adding 75,000 skilled and talented workers to our workforce over this decade confirms the findings of several other recent studies that are projecting a similar shortage of skilled workers uh, to meet the changing labor market demands in the near term, meaning within this decade as soon as 2028. That shortage, as we all know, and has been referred to by previous speakers, uh, is a result of uh, obvious changes in the demographics of the current workforce and the job market changes that we are all experiencing in particular during the pandemic year that we've just been through. This critical need for a bold investment in workforce development was also cited in the November 2020 report of the Economic Recovery Committee, which recommended a talent development initiative to quote, unleash the potential of Maine's workforce by creating educational and training pathways for people of all experience levels to access careers in high demand fields. I think that statement is a good umbrella for the purposes behind the bill that I'm presenting because it is both education and training and it is for long-term career development. Also, the need for the workforce investment or a, an investment during this legislative period uh, was acknowledged by the governor, Governor Mills in a recent state of the state address and the annual measures of growth reports that we, we see each year has repeatedly assigned a red flag designation to the decline of Maine's working age population percentage, which has now fallen below the US average of just over 60%. Last August, after receiving an off cycle report from our Consensus Economic Forecasting Commission during July, and a follow-up report from the Revenue Forecasting Committee at the end of that month, both of which captured the negative effects of the COVID pandemic on our main economy and projected general fund revenue declines of a significant magnitude. Right after getting those, those uh, reports, I came up with an idea and I decided to approach David Degler, the president of the Maine Community College System or main or MCCS and sought his advice as to how MCCS might be able to assist in crafting a response to this critical and looming workforce development challenge. This bond proposal is the product of those conversations. We wanted to launch a multi-year program building on recent and previous accomplishments that MCCS has made in meeting similar workforce development challenges of an urgent nature. A couple of examples that uh, identify both the reference to recent and previous. Um, we're all aware, I think, of the work of the uh, community colleges at all seven locations to do uh, for doing free training on the, through the main quality centers and funding that we've provided them to provide this training uh, on a short term turnaround basis. I think we um, uh, last March 17th, uh, those members of the 129th legislature will recall that in negotiating the elements of the supplemental budget at that time, we agreed on two workforce development initiatives as qualifying for supplemental funding. And again, I would say during the course of the 2020 pandemic year, all of us are familiar with the the effect of MCCS's work with the, the Puritan Medical Products uh, firm in Guilford, which pre uh, developed and, and produced the, uh, the swabs for testing for, for COVID. Um, and I think we also know that many other industries in Maine were responsible during the pandemic for uh, re 
redesigning their uh, equipment and manufacturing cap capacity to deal with production of other forms of personal protective equipment. The previous one that I referred to there as a, as a personal um, connection for me, and I think Representative Martin would remember it too, in the mid to late 80s, I'm sorry, the 70s, there was a, a significant employer in Southern York County that closed up laying off hundreds of employees in that Southern Maine economy. It happened that the Pratt & Whitney aircraft operations then based in Connecticut became aware of that event and aware of the facility that had been vacated, approached then Governor Jim Longley and asked if they might uh, come into that site and employ um, an extended amount of, or number of uh, machinists and welders and other people they need in their craft if we could assist them in a training effort. Um, the governor, uh, I was commissioner of education at the time, asked if we had any uh, resources within our education system. It happened that there were people at the Southern Maine Vocational Technical Institute at the time that were skilled in these short-term delivery training programs. Um, with Pratt & Whitney funding most of the cost, we developed a very quick uh, and very comprehensive training program that operated out of Sanford um, with um, hundreds of potential employees for these uh, jobs that were being promised by Pratt & Whitney. That came to fruition in a very short period of time. The Pratt & Whitney facility in North Berwick is still functioning today. And I have done some real rough math over the years to think about how much of a contribution that has made to the main economy over the nearly 43 years since it was operationalized. It is huge because these are good paying jobs. They provided career opportunities for people to live in, the, in Maine and, and raise their families here and have been major contributors to the economy that we are seeing today. There are other uh, events that I could refer to um, but I would also make knowledge or reference to something we haven't dealt with as a committee yet, but in the report back of the Education and Cultural Affairs Committee, there is a recommendation for an infusion of new money to support this kind of activity, building on an ALFON grant that has been in place and utilized by the community colleges over the last couple of years. And I think that uh, President Degler will make reference to that. Today, in the backdrop of the bonds that we're hearing now and the issue of timing and critical importance that I associate with this, this bill, I think that uh, both President Daigler and I would agree that the need to do something is more immediate than a November bond question would satisfy. Further, the opportunity to use potential yet to be defined, yet to be interpreted, one-time funding sources using either state, federal, or both types of sources opens the door for making a bold funding commitment this session. I actually believe that the, um, there are multiple cabinet agencies right now that are poised to play an important role in doing a redesign of this proposal into a more immediate uh, commitment of resources including such agencies as DHHS with their um, substantial interest in the healthcare community. And we've heard references this morning already to the nursing shortages, the Department of Education, both K-12 and the career and technical centers, as well as higher ed, um, DECD with their oversight of the strategic plan and their uh, commitment to a 10-year um, uh, plan. Department of Labor with its labor economists and its access to the numbers of high, high, high demand labor sectors that we ought to be focusing on. Um, the Department of, of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry for a focus on the food industry issues that we heard about a bond bill on earlier this week that I think reference uh, changes within the agricultural world that we might incorporate here as well. Obviously the infrastructure issues in transportation and other departments of state government could be helpful 
in identifying the most critical sequential high demand job sectors and could be supportive of undertaking this magnitude and important uh, offering uh, undertaking that I'm talking about today. It could result in a unique opportunity for a high level legislative executive partnership that could lead to generational improvements in the main economy of the future, as well as enhancing career opportunities for present and future main skilled workers and the families that they will support for years to come. I look forward to working with my AFA colleagues, other legislators and executive branch supporters in the redesign and enactment of this important initiative. I thank you for your time and attention. And I know President Degler can expand upon my comments in terms of the modifications of the bond bill that is before you and uh, maybe a more intensive and immediate approach. You might sense in the bill's content, um, my interest in looking at bonds from the point of view of having regular reportings on the outcomes of the investments. And my goal of having those reports get public attention uh, wherein the bill asks that we get annual reports of the progress made, the numbers of skilled workers trained to the Departments of Labor and to the um, Committee on Appropriations and Financial Affairs. But given the, the immediacy of the need, I would recommend that this not be considered as a bond subject, but one of more immediate importance for us to consider and talk through in the weeks to come. So thank you for your attention this morning. Thank you, Representative Millett. Any questions from the committee for Representative Millett? All right, not seeing any at the moment. Um, I will ask folks who are here in the attendee list uh, to raise their hand. I see um, President Daigler of the Community College System um, and I will move you over now to the panelist. Senate, <clears throat> whoa, here we go. Good morning. Um, if you'd like to turn on Good your morning. camera, there you go. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. Right. Thank you. There's always that moment of panic when you move and all of a sudden the screen has just gone blank on you. Yes, so. <laughs> <clears throat> we identify with that, but um, you're set and we are all ears. All right, well, Senator Breen, Representative Pierce, um, members of the Committee on Appropriations and Financial Affairs. I am, as has been stated, David Degler, president of the Maine Community College System. And I am here to testify in support of LD 481. The bill itself is an act to propose a general fund bond issue to train workers in high demand sectors and support the state's 10 year economic plan goal of increasing wages by 10%. I think we wanna focus on that aspect of the title that says train workers in high demand sectors and support the state's 10 year economic plan goal of increasing wages by 10%. First, I do wanna thank Representative Millett for his bold vision. And as importantly, his desire to assure that all Maine people have access to the training they need to succeed and to thrive. This bill seeks funding for our shared goal of increasing wages for all Maine citizens and building a robust and sustainable economy. Now, I'm sure you all had your own reasons for running for the legislature, but I'm willing to bet most of you were inspired to run because you wanted to help shape the future of Maine. Your time has come. As crippling as this pandemic has been, we're at an inflection point, a point where lasting and meaningful change is possible. The investment we are proposing here is bold and it is necessary. If you listen to my state of MCCS address, you're aware of the stark changes our economy is experiencing. People with skills, or what I call earning power, have great opportunities. But people without skills, the skills our economy demands, are destined to prolong unemployment. 
As I reported in the state of MCCS address, low wage, low skilled jobs are slipping away and they're not coming back. The bold investment proposed by Representative Millett provides an opportunity to reskill Maine's workforce. It is consistent with the goals of the 10 year economic plan and the recommendations of the Economic Recovery Committee. Now you've seen the wisdom of these investments. They came with your decision when you last, last year during the pandemic, um, as it was beginning, as, as the pandemic was just breaking out and you had to cut the 129th legislative session short, that investment allowed us, allowed us to respond whenever Maine's economy needed our help. Now is the time for a really bold move, a move that can set Maine up for a prosperous future. Now, fortunately, and Senator, uh, Representative Millett referred to this, MCCS is two plus years into a Harold L. Fond Foundation grant that has allowed us to build our workforce development capacity. We now have the systems in place to step up high impact short-term training programs at each of the seven colleges. That infrastructure has enabled the colleges to be responsive and to bring training programs to scale very quickly. Representative Millett referred to Puritan medical products. We began hearing about them just about one year ago right now. Since Puritan announced its expansion, MCCS has developed new training programs for 1,200 new Puritan employees in medical swab technician. These are good jobs in a part of the state that needs an economic boost. Over this past year, your community colleges have provided powerful examples time and time again of their ability to work closely with industry and develop the training that delivers the skilled workforce employers need. We do so quickly and reliably, but we're not cutting corners. We're focused on building a complete portfolio of skills, skills necessary to be successful. We've streamlined that training, tailored it to high demand areas and moved with agility at the speed of business to benefit both the workers and the employers of this state. The investment that Representative Millett proposed would train between 4,000 and 5,000 Mainers each year for the next four years, 20,000 Mainers in all. It is an investment. The increase in wages will generate income for Mainers the benefit from our training and new tax revenues for the state. The investment is returned to the state treasury within three years. It supports businesses in all areas of the state and in all economic sectors. It will support workforce expansion to meet the state's climate plan meet, uh, goals. It promotes short-term training for healthcare jobs like CNAs, LPNs, medical assistants, and more. We can deliver training to advance our manufacturing industry, allowing our manufacturers to fill orders that their competitors in other states cannot. We can continue to make progress in the, in the hospitality industry, progress advanced during the pandemic that is attracting more people to our state. We can continue our work within K-12 in the local school districts, building a workforce that can ensure our youngest Mainers stay on track. And we can con continue supporting professional loggers, as, as well as the development of a robust aquaculture industry, and build the administrative skills needed for work in the modern office. Now, we realized your time is short today, and we've talked with our partners, and we candidly ask them to respect your time today. But you will be hearing from them. They're very anxious to work with you. Over the next few weeks, as you seek and gain clarity around Maine's current revenue picture and the incoming federal aid, the businesses we work with want to make sure the need for investments in workforce development are in clear focus. With that, I'll leave you with one final thought. Maine has an incredible opportunity. More than any time in our history, the economy is in transition. Our unemployment lines are filled with people who lack the skills that are needed in the modern economy. If we can deliver the skills to Maine people, skills that give them traction in the economy, we can lift their lives. We can make our businesses more competitive and we can elevate our, our economy for generations to come.
Let's not miss our shot. Thank you. Thank you, President Dangler. Any questions uh, from the committee? I see Representative Hymanson. Hi, thanks for being here, talking about this important Thank you. issue. Um, the students who you would draw for these programs, where do you, where will they come from, both in and out of state, and how would you attract them into the program? We are attracting them. We work with our partner at the Department of Labor. We put out advertisements and, and we work within the communities. One of the benefit of the community colleges is that they're very embedded in their communities. We have not had trouble filling the, the uh, training programs. Okay, I guess that's my question. Do you anticipate that you would have trouble filling these programs? No, no. Um, people recognize that they need skills to transition into the new economy. And the economy is changing very rapidly and it's becoming a skill-based economy. And people recognize that and they have come to us. We've worked very closely with our, with our business partners. And oftentimes the business partners are prepared to pay a, a stipend during the training period so that the employer, so that the trainees have some wages or some form of income so that they can provide for their families. And that gives them the traction they need to get through, get the training and get to a job. Yeah, no, thank you for that. You know, down here, working with um, York County Community College and Pratt and & Whitney and, and the CTE Center in uh, school in, in Samford, I'm aware of the, you know, how that's working, which is terrific. Um, we just need more people, more warm bodies in this state who are moving in here. So I wonder if there is a way to attract people who are out of state to come here for these opportunities. Do you see that as being something that, that would happen? I see that and I think we are seeing that. One of the things that's happened during the pandemic is Maine has developed a reputation, a brand for being a healthy place to live. And if we continue to build that brand and offer a strong vital economy, it will start to attract people into our state. That economic boost, that opportunity to get a high paying job will be important to attract people and they will come and they're coming now. Mm -hmm. Is there, are there places for people to live as they um, train around the community colleges? The, the training, the training pro, so we have um, provided some living stipends and there are opportunities for them. Our residence halls during the pandemic were, were um, sparsely populated just for um, uh, safety reasons. And we'll be expanding our residence hall populations when we, when we come into session this fall. Thank you. Any other questions for President Daigler? All right, don't see any, but we certainly know where to find you if we need you. I hope man, look me up. Thank you. Thank for you very up. much. I'm All gonna right. send you back to attendee land. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else um, in the attendee panel who wants to speak on this bill, uh, LD 481? If so, please raise your hand. I'm not seeing any. Um, so if there is uh, no further comment on LD 481, I think I will close the public hearing for that bill. And we will move on now to um, LD 702, Representative Rebecca Millette, who is here in attendee land. So we're gonna uh, move her over and have you join us and introduce your bill. All right, there's uh, Representative Millette. So, sorry to mangle that. Um, formerly Senator, now Representative Millette. Welcome and um, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much, Senator. 
Good morning, Senator Breen, Representative Purse, and distinguished members of the Committee on Appropriations and Financial Affairs. I am Representative Rebecca Millett, representing District 30, which is most of Cape Elizabeth. And I'm pleased to present LD702, an act to authorize a general fund bond issue to recapitalize the school revolving renovation fund. The School Revolving Renovation Fund, or SRRF, provides loans to school administrative units to finance project expenditures. A portion of each loan is considered a grant and is forgiven. The forgiveness rate ranges from 30% to 70% and is based on the percentage of state subsidy paid to the local SAU. The remaining balance of the loan is paid back over either five or 10 years at a 0% interest rate. The loan repayments revolve back into the SRRF and are then used to fund other approved projects. And the maximum loan that can be provided is capped at $1 million per priority per school building within, within any five year period. The SRRF was developed in 1999 based on the recommendations of the Commission on School Facilities, including providing $200 million over five years to address our schools aging facilities and antiquated systems. In contrast, roughly 175 million was made available over 20 years. The last biennial budget did include $18 million from the general fund and all of that, all of that remains is roughly $1 million, a number so low that the department is not accepting applications. Without any new infusion of capital, the department estimates that it could take three to four years before it holds another application cycle once there is roughly $8 million available for loans, <clears throat> excuse me, from future loan repayments. At one point, I believe the fund balance was roughly 75 million or more, but the fund has faced a constant demand larger than the fund itself. Many main community school buildings require structural upgrades or improvements to help avoid the need for new building construction. According to the American Society of Civil Engineers, between 1999 and 2015, the SRRF program funded 171 million out of 346 million of requests. This represents a funding level of slightly over 49% of the requests during that time frame. Some projects have been requested more than once. The urgency of this matter grows every year. I'm including two links below of coverage on this issue from 2018 that paints a stark picture of many of our schools. I hope you will read them and agree that this is better, that it is better to be penny wise to avoid being pound foolish. I ask you to support LD702. Thank you for your consideration and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Representative Millett. Are there any questions um, for Representative Millett from the committee? Uh, not seeing any. Okay. All right. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, I don't see anybody in um, the attendee list with a hand up. Oh, I do actually. I see uh, Mr. Hess is here again. So I will move him over to, um, oh, now his hand is down. So now his hand is up. All right, I will move Mr. Hess over to the panel. Welcome back, Mr. Hess. Uh, we cannot hear you, even though you're not on mute. I'm not sure what's going on. Let, let's try that with the microphone there in front of go. my mouth, Senator Breen. Thank so, you. Uh, sorry, I'm using some different technology this morning. Uh, Senator Breen, uh, Representative Peirce, honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Appropriations and Financial uh, Affairs. 
pleasure to be with you again this morning. My name is Wilson Hess, Chair of the State Board of Education, speaking in support of LD702. Um, the State Board of Education um, uh, under Title 20A um, is, is responsible for approving projects for state construction aid. Currently, uh, those projects uh, total about $130 million a, a year per, for new construction aid. Thus, we have a significant role in school construction in Maine. Even though we have no oversight authority on the school revolving renovation fund, we have a very strong interest in supporting it due to its impact on other construction needs uh, around the state. Um, five points I'd like to make, uh, hopefully briefly. In the last major capital funding cycle, the state board approved over $600 million in new um, uh, construction and additions and renovation projects. During that cycle, the board funded only 40 of 81 qualifying applications uh, doing, due to limited availability of funds. In 2018, we released a new priority list for a new round of funding that includes 74 qualifying projects that are seeking uh, construction funding. It is likely once again that more than half this time will be unfunded. The current cost of new construction uh, really uh, allows us to fund two to three projects annually. Um, given that backlog, there's massive renovation and repair need. Um, in addition to the new construction backlogs that we just talked about, Maine schools are experiencing massive renovation and repair needs. And I think Senator, or excuse me, Representative Millett did a very nice job uh, characterizing some of that. Apparently, approximately 60% of Maine school buildings are more than 50 years old. Some are more than 100 years old. Current building relating standards and codes addressing issues such as ventilation, by the way, especially important uh, in this post pandemic era that we're entering, ADA structures, uh, life safety, et cetera, were simply not in place at the time uh, of the construction of our aged school buildings. Many were constructed at a time when lead and asbestos containing materials were preferred, not prohibited, as building products. In its 2016 report card for Maine's infrastructure, the Maine section of the American Society of C Civil Engineers gave Maine's pre-K through 12 uh, schools a grade of C, characterized in their lexicon as, quote, mediocre and requiring attention, close quote. Based on that report, we face, at that time, 2016, um, 914 million dollars in capital funding needs far beyond the low the, the the means of local resources that's a billion dollars in round numbers uh, the scope of funding uh, for repair and renovation looks something like this when the fund originated in, in 1998 a target of 200 million was established to meet statewide needs as identified through a survey conducted by the Center of Research and Evaluation at the University of Maine. Since inception, approximately half of that amount, 100 million from both state appropriations and bonds um, has been contributed to the fund. Uh, in addition, uh, the last addition prior to the, the, the funding uh, that uh, Representative uh, Millett referred to in her testimony uh, was in 2008. The revolving nature of the fund has resulted in approximately 175 million in loans over the past 20 years. The rising cost of construction today means that that represents the investment in approximately two modest size high schools. Fortunately, revolving fund projects are often used to leverage local dollars to do more significant renovations, extending built buildings usable lives and meeting critical needs for backlog projects. The fund has been very effective in improving the safe, uh, safety, health, and efficiency of Maine schools, facilities. In fact, safety and health are uh, the, among the top prioritizations. Um, the, the representative Millett mentioned that there were priorities. The project prioritizations briefly look something like this. Um, uh, the rules governing revolving renovation funds require awarding funds 
according to these five priorities. Number one, health, safety, and compliance. Number two, building structures, water, and septic disposal. Number three, repairs and improvements related to energy and water conservation. Number four, upgrades of learning spaces. Number five, other projects approved by the commissioner. Given current funding of the revolving renovation fund, um, for the past five years, very few projects beyond priority one have been funded. And as Representative Millett indicated, um, we do not anticipate uh, funding uh, for several years, uh, given the current uh, size of the fund um, and uh, the, uh, the repayment schedule. Um, pandemic impact. Um, our recent experiences with the COVID-19 pandemic have brought heightened awareness to indoor air quality in our schools. The State Board's Construction Committee has grown increasingly aware for several years that our present air quality provisions, and this started prior to COVID, are not consistent with the best available techniques and technology for air quality and ventilation in schools. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the best available practice standards uh, by the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers, uh, acronym ASHRAE, for the inspection, maintenance, uh, and ventilation of filtration dates from 2009. Um, the pending um, um, American Recovery Plan ESSER funds uh, that we see, third round of ESSER, will be, be coming on board uh, in the upcoming months, and we believe um, that they will provide resources to assess the magnitude of these best available practice shortfalls. What it appears they will not be able to do is provide funds uh, to correct them. Um, a healthy physical environment is essential in providing best quality education. There's lots of science on that now. LD702 represents an important initiative to respond to the broad and significant issue of the safety and air quality and ventilation and our students learning environments statewide. The State Board and the Department of Education are working jointly to see that federal funds will be available uh, to do that comprehensive statewide assessment, bringing it uh, uh, up to best available practice standards. The cost of those renovations alone is likely to absorb any revolving renovation funds that we see uh, coming on board in the next several years and fall far short of meeting those needs. Uh, overview, members of the committee, uh, the main school revolving renovation fund is one of the primary alternatives for unfunded projects to meet the educational operation and often primarily critical health and safety needs uh, in our schools. It's a popular and successful program which assists local school units in providing health and safety learning environments, excuse me, healthy and safe learning environments while extending the lives of buildings. The State Board of Education's perspective on school construction suggests strongly that the unmet need for school construction in the upcoming cycle will be daunting. The main school revolving renovation fund can be an important, indeed a critical part of our statewide response to keep the fund uh, sustainable uh, and make possible continued efforts to address aging infrastructure as we move aggressively to comply with air quality standards uh, issues. Um, for these reasons, the State Board is strongly in support of LD702. Be happy to ask or answer any questions you may ask. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Hess from the committee? Uh, not seeing any, um, but we appreciate you being here today. Um, thank you for your patience and, and sticking with us through multiple bills. And um, we will follow up if we have any more questions for you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, is there anybody in the attendee list who wants to speak on this bill? If so, please raise your electronic hand. Um, not seeing any. So um, I will close the hearing for um, for LD702. And uh, the last bill we have on our list today is LD1095, um, sponsored by Senator Pouliot, 
who is here and I will move you Senator over to the panel. Good morning, Good morning. Stella. Welcome. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. You can Great. proceed. Awesome, thank you. Senator Breen, Representative Purse, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Appropriations and Financial Affairs, it's great to see you again today. I'm Senator Matt Pouliot, and I represent uh, Senate District 15, which consists of the towns of Augusta, China, Oakland, Sydney, and Vassarboro. And I'm here today to present LD 1095, which is, an, which is an act to authorize a general fund bond issue to purchase four nursing simulators for use by the University of Maine system and the Maine Community College system. This legislation will give Maine voters the opportunity to decide whether to approve a $3.2 million bond to provide funding for the University of Maine system to purchase four nursing simulators to be shared with the Maine Community College system. Maine has been and is currently facing a shortage of nurses due to the demand for healthcare services um, because of our state's aging population, coupled with the wave of pending retirements in the nursing profession. Layer on the effects of the pandemic and the need for more nurses has been accelerated. According to the Maine Department of Labor, by 2025, there will be a shortage of 3,200 registered nurses here in Maine. The availability of in-person training for nurses has been diminished due to the rapid changes in clinical uh, placements, patient safety issues, and ethical concerns. Students' direct experience with patient care and opportunities to handle problem-based clinical situations has been diminished. <clears throat> these additional simulators will help these issues and uh, they provide realistic uh, clinical scenarios. They provide rare emergency situations and provide a variety of authentic life-threatening situations. Some of the advantages of simulation-based education include the ability to provide immediate feedback, repetitive practice learning, the ability to adjust the difficulty level and the opportunity for diverse types of learning strategies. Lastly, the additional nursing simulators will increase the ability for nursing students to complete uh, rotations, getting more nurses into the field faster. Sharing the simulators between the University of Maine system and the Maine Community College system will ensure that they are used to capacity. I thank you for your consideration. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Senator Pouliot. Any questions for Senator Pouliot on um, LD1095? I am not seeing any. Thank you all. Um, thank you. Um, is there anyone in the attendee list who would like to testify on LD 1095? Um, I see uh, Becky Smith and Samantha Warren. So I'm gonna move Ms. Smith over into the panelist. Actually, I'll move you both over um, and have um, Ms. Smith start and then uh, Ms. Warren will go after her. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. Yes, I have a few minutes left of the morning. Uh, Senator Breen, Representative Purse, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Appropriations and Financial Affairs. My name is Becky Smith. I'm the Director of Government and Community Relations for the Maine Community College System. I'm here today to provide support for LD 1095. Maine's community colleges are an integral part of Maine's healthcare and public health infrastructure. Healthcare is our largest program area. We educate close to 2,000 residents every year, studying to become nurses, LPNs, medical assistants, CNAs, PT assistants, cardiovascular radiography, and respiratory technicians, and the list goes on. Each and every one of our colleges has multiple allied health programs. Some are free short-term training programs that get students ready to work in weeks. Some result in badges and micro-credentials. The bulk of them are two year long associate degree programs such as nursing, and many are the only program in the state and often in the region. We are very proud that our nursing students pass rate for the most recent NCLEX or nursing exam was above the state average, over 90% pass rate for every college who had students sit for the exam. Our students are well-educated and ready to work. However, there are not enough of them. As you well know, Maine's healthcare workforce is in dire straits. 
Maine's community colleges are working round the clock and in new and creative ways to get our well-educated graduates out into the healthcare workforce, but we do not have enough resources. Our programs are continuously at capacity and we often turn people away, in part due to lack of training spaces and opportunities, and in part due to our aging nurse educator workforce. We hear time and time again from healthcare employers that they have a huge nursing shortage and they need us to do more. Maine healthcare providers will need to fill 1,150 nursing vacancies per year based on current hiring practices, while Maine's colleges and universities, both public and private, graduate only 750 nurses per year. That shortage is forcing work normally performed by nurses to be reassigned to other health providers, primarily trained by the Maine Community College System. Demand for medical assistance is projected to grow 19% through 2029, much faster than the average for all occupations. Likewise, demand for phlebotomists is projected to grow 17%, CNAs 8%, surgical technicians 7%, and EMTs 6% through the end of the decade. We do offer some friendly suggestions as you consider this proposal. The University of Maine system campuses are not always proximate to our students, faculty, and campuses. Sharing this equipment is a fantastic way to assure we are best using our available resources, but it must be done in a way and in locations that can serve most of Maine. There are mobile options for simulation labs that could help fulfill the goals of this bill, or conversely, we could house two on MCCS campuses where we see the largest need and the university system could do the same. Two of our nursing programs offered these thoughts as you consider this proposal. Kathy McManus, the chair of the nursing department at Central Maine Community College stated, simulation has become an integral part of teaching methodologies in nursing education. Every student, nursing student in the MCCS is educated using simulation during the course of their program. Simulation allows for realistic, context-rich rich unfolding learning in a safe environment. Simulation offers the student a chance to make clinical judgments for patient care and to evaluate the outcomes of their decisions, often learning from each other as well as the faculty during debriefing sessions. Students can learn and perform skills not allowed or seldom seen in the clinical environment. And she has some more comments that I won't read at this time, just in the interest of time. We also heard from Pilar Burmeister, who's the chair of nursing at Eastern Maine Community College. And she wanted to add that for um, the community colleges to provide the highly critical training for future nurses responding directly to the needs of the healthcare service system in the state. Our partner hospitals generously provide access to their simulation labs, but it is fairly limited time and often needs to accommodate several different nursing education programs within a region. And this uh, additional support from this bill will create additional access for students to further experience hands-on skill development. And the consideration of a mobile simulation lab will further extend the reach and opportunity for several students, particularly in isolated rural areas. For approximately $500,000, a mobile simulation lab could potentially be used throughout the year, shared with Washington County Community College and extend access. The resources itemized in this bond proposal, along with our budget request, which was unanimously supported by the Education Committee and support for nurse educators, which was unanimously supported by the IDEA Committee, has the opportunity to help Maine's colleges and universities meet this demand. With all three of these parts in place, we and the University of Maine system can get down to the rewarding work of training the next generation of nurses and medical professionals. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Any questions from the committee for Ms. Smith? Not seeing any at this time. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. And uh, now we have Samantha Warren. Welcome, Ms. Warren. The floor is yours. Good morning, Senator Breen, Representative Purse, and distinguished members of the committee. Good to see you. I'm Sam Warren. I'm Director of Government and Community Relations for Maine's Public Universities. And you will see us before you anytime there is an opportunity to speak in support of investments in nursing education and workforce training as proposed by this legislation. As I think you're well aware, we've talked about uh, with many of you before, the two factors that are most limiting enrollment growth in uh, the post-secondary nursing programs that develop the bulk of the workforce pipeline are inadequate uh, facilities and not enough faculty. 
I give you an example that our universities are receiving a record number of applications, more than 3,100 for the current uh, academic year across the system, which is a 16% increase from just two years ago. Unfortunately, we are forced to turn away hundreds of qualified candidates due to faculty and facility constraints. And you just heard uh, my, my colleague at the community colleges speak about that. At the University of Maine alone, there were over 1,400 applications for just 80 slots in this year's uh, incoming class. I most wanted to be here with you today to let you know that the past investments you've made in nursing education facilities are paying off. Uh, we have used funds from the infrastructure general obligation bond that you supported and the people in Maine in turn supported in 2018, uh, uh, as well as private funding to expand and enhance simulator space and thus nursing enrollment at the University of Maine, the University of Southern Maine, and also at the University of Maine at Presque Isle. And, uh, as, as I know Representative Martin uh, will appreciate and others among you, that simulation space at the University of Maine at Presque Isle was named in honor of your former colleague in the legislature and my predecessor at the University of Maine system, John Lisnick, uh, and was dedicated in a small socially distant ceremony with his family uh, this fall. The state of the art simulation space has allowed the University of Maine at Fort Kent to bring its high, high uh, in demand Bachelor of Science in Nursing program to central Aroostook County for the first time in direct support of local workforce needs. And in its first year, there are 78 students already enrolled using that simulation space daily. Um, and because that space was uh, built to include obstet obstetrics simulation, not currently available at UMFK. 80 students from the St. John Valley are currently traveling to Presque Isle to additionally use that simulation space. So again, that investment that you made is, is already uh, really paying off in Aroostook County. Despite these investments and that our nursing uh, programs are the largest degree producing programs in the system, our campus leaders still identify the lack of adequate simulation equipment and space, as well as lab spaces across all campuses as the limit on enrollment and student experience. That's why we support this bill. Uh, in addition to basic needs like OB equipment at UMFK so that students didn't have to travel an hour south to Presque Isle, uh, we can envision uh, adding a simulation space in Farmington where the University of Maine at Augusta is, uh, will start uh, delivering its BSN program this fall. And as Becky spoke about, we see an opportunity to uh, purchase some uh, joint mobile units uh, that could be shared with the community college system as well as uh, community healthcare partners that would allow student training and also give us an opportunity to bring some, uh, you know, some types of clinical care that our students and faculty could deliver to rural communities. If you move this bond forward, whether it's through bonding or some other mechanism, uh, it needs to be coupled with investments in uh, nursing education faculty. Uh, as, as Becky spoke about, the IDEA committee has unanimously supported uh, funding the nursing faculty uh, educators loan uh, repayment program, which was created wisely by the 122nd legislature, but has not been uh, funded uh, since. Uh, all of our programs have critical vacancies uh, on the faculty lines. Since the director of the UMaine School of Nursing program joined us six years ago, 80% of the faculty in that program have either retired or passed away. Again, that's a program that had 1,400 applicants, only 80 of which could be accepted. Meanwhile, at USM, the nursing faculty is the smallest it has been in at least 15 years, despite historic enrollment at both the undergraduate and graduate level. Again, that high enrollment is in, in part because of the simulation expansion that 2018 bond supported. The COVID pandemic has certainly reinforced the connection between public and economic health, uh, that the task force that examined 21st century workforce and economics uh, in the state several years ago and, and made this recommendation noted uh, as our oldest in the nation state looks to rebuild its, its economy and communities, the need for nurses is now greater than ever. And with these investments, our universities and certainly the community colleges as well can better serve those who aspire to become nurses and those whose lives depend on their care. Thank you for the opportunity and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Warren. Any questions for Ms. Warren from any committee members? Not seeing any. Thank you for joining us.
so um, that is uh, the entirety of our public hearings. Well, let me close the public hearing now for LD 1095. And um, looks like Representative Hymanson has a question. No, okay. Um, so that uh, concludes our committee work for today and for this week. Um, we will be together again next week to hear some more um, bond hearings on Monday and Tuesday, both uh, Wednesday, we will be in session at the Civic Center. And then we will have some more bond hearings on Thursday, the 29th. Um, and um, also starting at 10 a.m. So um, are there any questions um, from the committee about our schedule? Um, Anything coming up that uh, folks need more information about before we adjourn for the day? Anything from our analyst, Maureen, to uh, update us on or make sure is on our radar? I think it's all covered, thank you. All right. Well, thank you everybody um, for being together this week, uh, virtually anyway. and. I know I look forward to seeing everybody in person next week at the Civic Center. So um, with that, I will conclude our, our uh, session today and wish everyone a healthy and good weekend. And um, again, it's great to have Representative Martin back with us um, and really glad to see you and have you back in committee this week. All right, thanks everybody.